There are Cortex t-shirts. There are. Now that we kind of finished the first 10, we are marking it with a with a t-shirt design. Um, and we are doing something called Teespring, which I know you've never done before. So I will explain it to you, Gray, um, in an effort to also explain it to our dear listeners. Yes, thank you. Because I know this is a thing that you have done uh, with several of your Relay shows. Yeah. And I, I am unfamiliar with this at all. So I do need this explained to me. So Teespring is basically like crowdfunding for, for T-shirts. Mm-hmm. So we set a goal and... We set like for, to sell seventy five shirts as a minimum, mm-hmm. okay, just because that's where the it makes sense. But they will actually print as long as there's a profit. It's kind of a weird thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and we have two different variants of shirt uh, for men and women. We have a gray shirt and a blue shirt mm-hmm. with our little monkey brain guy on, who I would like to give a name to. Um, we can we can table that discussion for another time. We went back and forth a couple times, and the designer that you work with came up with. What I thought was something very cute for this run of shirts, which, yes, is half half of it is the Cortex Brain logo, but the bottom half of it is a little monkey head, which is a thing that we have we have mentioned before about trying to working with yourself is is in some sense trying to work with the monkey that is inside your own brain. So that's kind of the idea behind this T-shirt for season one. And I like it. I think it looks great. So we have our little monkey brain. And then on the back of the T-shirt, we have uh, the coding of the redundant T-shirt. So people know that this is, in fact, a redundant Mm T-shirt. Maybe you could buy more than one. So you have redundant, redundant Mm -hmm. T-shirts. So they're there. And what will happen is once the end of the campaign is done, so it's two weeks from the day that we release this episode. So the campaign will end on the 11th of September. So you have until the 11th of September to buy a shirt. And once it's... Once the campaign is over, this run of t-shirts will be done. And so basically what we may do, we may bring this design back in the future. We may not. We're just seeing how interested people are in this shirt and then we can work out where to go from there. But if you want one, you want to go to teespring.com slash cortex and buy one or two. (laughs) Or you can buy many, many redundant t-shirts for you to have. I'm probably going to buy like three or four of them. Excellent. And the two colors, so I consider the gray one the gray shirt and the blue one the mic shirt. Oh, yeah? Is that what it is? That's how I think of this, yeah. Okay. The blue one is the mic edition? Yeah, because I I wanted it to be a color Mm -hmm. because I have way too many gray and black t-shirts. You can never have too many black t-shirts. This was why I knew we had to have a gray version because I wanted a color version, but uh, I knew that you wouldn't allow it only to be just one color, so that's why there's two colors. The blue is the one for Mike and... The gray is the one for me, because I will definitely be getting the gray one. You won't even buy one of the blue ones? But that's that's the one for you. I'm going to buy them both, but... I don't have any t-shirts in any color except black and very dark gray. Interesting. Why would I have other ones? Then you just get into a whole problem of having to match your wardrobe in the morning. Not interested. Cortex is also now on YouTube. Can you explain this to me? I'm so confused. Does it even have a URL? I don't understand how it works. Oh, God. I don't even know if it has a URL right now. Uh, <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> this is... This is... Uh, okay. Well, let's let's back up for a second before we get to the URL thing, which I can complain about in a moment. But uh, I will have to explain this to you because I also have to try to figure it out for me as well. But I, I know that there is some audience of people who, for whatever reason, likes to listen to podcasts on youtube perhaps they're just trying to consolidate all of their media consumption in one place so on hello internet we've had the hello internet podcast on youtube for a while now and i know because i hear from people who complain that i'm too far behind on the shows that they prefer to listen to it that way so we make it available there and so i thought well why don't we set that up for cortex as well in case people are interested so some people do like to listen on youtube and so we are going to put it there for them and we were just uh, arranging the specifics of that this morning, finalizing things. But yes, it has been a very long time since I set up a brand new, unconnected to anything YouTube channel. And because YouTube just changes things so often and they've they've gone through a Google Plus integration stroke now disintegration process, it's it's just so confusing setting up a new YouTube channel, even for someone who is ostensibly a professional YouTuber. So I was trying to figure out all the things like, how do I get a designated URL? And the answer was not easily when you're setting up something that's new. 
But uh, we will have the link in the show notes. Maybe there will, maybe there won't be a real URL by the time this goes up. But there will be a place that you can listen to Cortex on YouTube if you so desire. I guess there will be a URL, but it would be horrible to read. (laughs) Yeah, this seems to be the way companies like Facebook and Google are doing things sometimes where maybe they want to get out of the the equivalent of domain name squatting where people are just trying to grab URLs and instead just trying to make everybody search for everything. So if you go to YouTube and you search for Cortex, I'm sure you'll find it. The funny thing about talking about this is the people that need it won't hear it. Yeah, I was realizing that as we were explaining it, as I'm trying to figure out, again, who is going to be the person who receives this message when they need to? Because I am also going to be handing this entirely over to you. So I don't know what the the schedule of the shows on YouTube is going to be. I am Neither do I. I have set things up and then I am washing my hands of the, of the entirety of it and leaving it in your very capable hands with your gigantic relay company to deal with these things but yes i'm trying to figure out who is who is going to be the person who hears this message right now is the person who's listening on a podcast player but would vastly prefer to listen on youtube instead but also doesn't mind going back right now and listening to the older episodes i guess that is the target audience for this we will see i expect that audience is huge (laughs) many multiples of our actual listeners right now you're back home and therefore back to work i assume or have you? Are you still on the Hawaiian lifestyle? Like, what's happening over there? Ah, uh, no, no, no more aloha spirit for me, thank you. I got back into London about a week ago now, and so, as always, having fun. First few days dealing with the jet lag, and now I am trying to ease myself back into a regular working schedule because it has been quite a long time since I've had a regular working schedule. Uh, this summer vacation ended up being much longer than I was originally expecting it was going to be. And uh, yeah, so now I'm just trying to de-jet lag myself and work myself back into a normal getting up early schedule, which makes me a much happier monkey when I'm in it, even though it can be a little bit difficult to actually wrench yourself back into that when you haven't done it for a while. I can attest to the fact that you're back into a working schedule as me and you have gotten more done this morning than I think the last three weeks combined. Oh, yeah? We've been very productive today. Yes, this morning was Cortex time. (laughs) In no small part because I was slightly avoiding getting back into writing time, Ah. which is way harder. (laughs) It's procrastinating working. That's what you're doing. Exactly. This is the, the thing with Cortex was, oh, I have a list, a list of very clear, very discreet items, each of which can be ticked off and accomplished. And you know what's way harder is the thing that I've been sort of trying to do the last day and a half, which is arrange my YouTube upload schedule for the next several months. And then once that is actually done, start writing the next video, which is very, very hard to do. I think this is probably the longest time I have gone without writing since uh ironically maybe the the very moment when i first started youtube professionally which is slightly a different story but yeah for the duration of my vacation i was still working on podcast stuff but i didn't have i didn't have uh time to work on podcast stuff and writing stuff so it's been a big break and i need to get back into that because again ostensibly i'm a professional youtuber though it's now feeling like it's been quite a while since i uploaded a video how do you feel about our new schedule? Uh, two weeks working out good for you so far? Well, you're baiting me with this question because you know you know full well that we arranged it was going to be every two weeks and we'd set things up. And then yesterday I made you change absolutely everything around. <laughs> and so uh, our new schedule lasted zero episodes oh, God, with I our know. new theoretical schedule. This is going to be the only episode that you're listening to right now that is on that schedule. I realize now we've changed this to every other Monday. Is that right? I don't even know. Well, (laughs) this is so confusing. This episode will come out on Friday. And then the next episode will come out not the following Monday, the Monday after. And then every Monday, every other two, no, every two weeks on that. Who see, knows? I tell you what, just wait and see. <laughs> <That's>, yeah. <laughs> it's a mystery. This, well, oh, see, now you, you have finally, you have finally come around to my policy on uploading things to the internet, which is you upload them when they're ready and you don't have to worry about a schedule. Oh, no, no, there definitely is one. I'm just finding it too hard to explain now. It's, it's right. just too difficult. I just think you shouldn't, you shouldn't worry about the schedule. You're making your own problems here, buddy, as far as I'm concerned. I will not accept that. I bought a Wacom tablet, as you know. Oh, did you? Yes, I did. I did. And I've played around with it a little bit. It's mm-hmm. very weird. 
It's very mm-hmm. weird. I did the thing that you suggested with the pen setting. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. instead of it feeling like a mouse where you can kind of accelerate and that moves the, the pointer, it is like mapped one to one with the monitor. Mm-hmm. Right. So if I put, if I want my mouse pointer to be on the top left, I have to put the pen on the top left. Right. Um, and there are a couple of things that I find weird, like you hover it over, right, and and tap down, um, and it's taking some getting used to. I could see how if I give my time to get give myself the time to get the hang of it, it could be a good tool for editing. I feel mm-hmm. like it's kind of natural and unnatural at the same time, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, it it takes a while to get used to a pen tablet. There's nobody who switches over to a pen tablet in pen mode and immediately says, oh, wow, this this feels naturally much better. You have to use it for a while uh, to get used to it. But I feel like I, I wish I had the more buttons on the pen. This depends on which model you have gotten. But uh, yeah, I have one that has two programmable buttons on it. And I don't know what you have. I have two. Okay. Uh, yeah. You sound sad about that. You want 100 buttons on your pen? Is that what you want? I want like five. Mm-hmm. I'm not quite sure how that would work actually holding it. No, it would be a nightmare. Yeah, th- I think that's why they don't put five on there. But I bought a new mouse as well. Oh, did you? How interesting. Yeah, and I think the mouse is going to win. What mouse did you buy? The Logitech MX Master. Okay, Mike, you're not going to believe this. My hand right now is resting on a Logitech MX Master mouse. Isn't it incredible? I just got it this morning, actually. So I, I don't know how <laughs> I don't know how incredible it is. Why did you buy it? Uh, I I saw it came up in one of my um, recommended YouTube videos. Was uh, MKBHD's KBHD's review. video? That's why I bought mine. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I hope Logitech is giving MKBHD some kickbacks because. I have been in the market for a long time for a real professional <laughs> mouse, and I never quite yeah. saw anything that I liked the look of. And I thought, oh, that looked very good, and his review really sold it for me. Mm-hmm. So I thought, oh, I would, uh, I'd like to try it. And it just arrived this morning. It's been on my desk for maybe two or three hours, so I can't really review it adequately. But uh, great minds think alike, I guess, is the lesson from this. You need to download the Logitech Options software. Mike, do you think I would buy... A, a mouse, a piece of hardware, and not immediately dive into the configuration software. Are you a crazy person? I've already tried to configure it in a whole bunch of different ways to see how this is going to work. I couldn't find the software. That was my main problem. It took me a long time. Uh-huh. Like Logitech's website was a nightmare. Mm-hmm. Um, but I I have this mouse set up in such a glorious way, Gray. It is making me so happy. I can move between spaces and stuff like that. I have configured the buttons to where I can basically do about about three quarters of all of the things that i do in logic with just the mouse now Mm -hmm. like i've set it up so one of the buttons is play pause i've set up one of the buttons so it's the modifier key Mm -hmm. so i can click that to get used different tools i have set the i've set like a delete key so i can delete stuff Hmm. oh and i also have a i can click down on the the you know the button that would usually change the mouse scrolly thing to either ratchet mm-hmm. or be smooth yeah i changed that immediately yeah i hate that uh, i have that button i press down on that button and i can zoom in and out on the on the waveforms did you do that with the gesture so that you, you press and hold and you move the mouse up and down and you zoom in is that what you're doing yeah mm-hmm. not only did we get the same mouse but we have chosen the same very particular configuration of one of the options of the mouse. Because I was trying to figure out as well, oh, I want the scroll wheel to zoom in and out when I'm in something like Logic or Final Cut, but I don't think that's possible to do. And so I was trying to figure out how to change it. But yes, for anybody who's listening, this this mouse is very cool looking and it has a lot of buttons. But more importantly, it has one of the things that really sold me was in addition to the vertical scroll bar, there is a horizontal scroll bar yeah or a horizontal scroll wheel i really should say that's underneath your thumb and if like mike and i you work with audio one of the biggest pains in the ass of dealing with logic is the horizontal movement of going back and forth that is the Mm -hmm. thing that always kills me is going back and forth and so when i was watching mkbhd's review and he said there's a horizontal scroll wheel it was like soul this is not a cheap mouse like this is like an 80 pound mouse it is it is expensive but it also oh the other thing that to me was the big selling feature uh was when i went to look at it on the website just to be sure 
they did mention that they have some kind of special laser in the bottom which can be used on glass and reflective surfaces mm -hmm. and that was important to me because the desk that i'm sitting at while while the top is not glass the desk is black and it has a very reflective surface to it and almost every other mouse i have ever used is just worthless on that surface and so i've often found myself in the strange position of using my tablet as a mouse pad for whatever mouse that I want to use <laughs> <laughs> because I just I need something so it's like oh let me either grab the Wacom tablet or oh there's an iPad handy right I need something as a mouse pad because I can't find a mouse pad that would stick to the surface that wasn't disgusting anyway this mouse from Logitech super delivers I like the horizontal scroll wheel so far and I can use it on a black shiny reflective surface so I'm, I'm definitely going to give it a try I will still, for the listeners, I will still be using the Wacom tablet a lot because I regularly switch input devices because of RSI concerns. So I always rotate out a mouse and a pen tablet and a trackball every once in a while just to keep things different. And I found that that really helps minimize RSI. So, I, But I, for the longest time, I haven't had a, a good mouse in that rotation. And I think this one looks pretty promising so far. Yeah, I... I can't i can't speak highly enough about it so how long have you been using it for three or four days hmm. but hmm. i have maybe racked up about seven hours in logic over that period mm -hmm. of time so mm -hmm. i'm using it a lot for that stuff and i really really like it and i've got it you know i've tweaked it to the like to the point of oblivion and uh, i'm very happy with the setup that i have and this is it really is just excellent and I'm very happy that you bought one as well. <laughs> but yeah, MKBHD is he's doing a good job for Logitech. This episode of Cortex is brought to you by Text Expander from Smile. If you're ever in the situation where you need to type the same sentences, phrases, or even words on a regular basis, then trust me, you need Text Expander in your life. Text Expander saves you time and effort by expanding short abbreviations into frequently used text and even pictures. And with a new look and feel for Mac OS X Yosemite, Text Expander 5 is here to help you type even faster than before by making suggestions of frequently typed phrases to abbreviate and save time. Text Expander will now remind you of missed opportunities when you're writing that essay paper to use abbreviations whilst you're typing. And the newly released version 5.1 improves suggestions by omitting most single dictionary words and giving you great control over the notifications and how they'll come through. So let me give you an example of another use of Text Expander that I love. Let's say that you frequently fill in a form with the same information. Maybe it's addresses, maybe it's credit card information, shipping stuff, whatever. You can make this super simple by creating a fill-in snippet. So in just a couple of keystrokes, you can fill in an entire form that may have taken you minutes before. And you can even use fill-in snippets to personalize and standardize repetitive replies. So let's say you have to send an email, which is very similar to many different types of people, but requires some specific specific information, maybe that person's name, or maybe you want to choose from a couple of different replies. You can set this up so you end up hitting a couple of keystrokes, you type in their name, and then you can choose maybe option A, B, and C from some drop-down lists to fill in that email super, super fast. You can sync all of your text expander snippets amongst multiple devices by storing them on iCloud Drive or Dropbox. This means that you'll have access to all of your snippets wherever you are. They're going to stay in sync everywhere. You can access your text expander snippets inside of Smile's iOS app or enable text expander in the 60 plus apps that are in the store that have integrated snippets like Fantastic L2, Drafts, Launch Center Pro, Editorial and many more. Or you can enable the iOS custom keyboard that comes with text expander for iOS so you can use your snippets in absolutely any app. Text expander 5 for the Mac also adds support for JavaScript which also works within text expander touch for iPad and iPhone. Text Expander is one of the first apps that I install on all of my devices. Without it, I am totally lost. Relying on Text Expander to help me save time is massively important for helping me get my work done. My Mac feels broken without Text Expander. It's like I'm typing characters and the things that I'm expecting just don't appear. I love it and cannot recommend it highly enough. Text Expander 5 costs $44.95 US with upgrades available for $19.95 for existing users and it's free to anyone who purchased Text Expander 
on or after January 1st, 2015. You can find out more about Text Expander 5 by visiting smilesoftware.com slash Cortex. Please note that Text Expander 5 requires Yosemite and Text Expander for iOS is available on the App Store for iPhone and iPad. Thank you so much to Smile for their support of this show. So I want to do some follow-up on mind maps because I have a couple of corrections I need to make. Yeah. 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 I have a correction for you. Mm. I feel like I have misrepresented uh, Adina's work. Yeah. You couldn't You couldn't have misrepresented what Adina does more by describing it as a mind map. I asked you to send me this picture after we were done, and this is no mind map. This is what we call a flowchart. I think almost anybody would recognize these as flowcharts. That's why what she does is useful, because it's an entirely different thing than useless mind maps. So... This isn't the only way that she works, and the other examples that she's given I can't share. But, like, she does different types of stuff. So, like, sometimes Mm. there's bubbles, sometimes there's arrows. And in my brain, I just have mushed it all together and called it mind mapping. Mm -hmm. Um, So, yes, I apologize to everybody, Uh, especially to VMAX77 on the Reddit, who who actually, (laughs) I can't believe I forgot this. I felt so bad about it. Creates mind maps for the episodes this show Mm -hmm. but yeah if you want to see a real mind map it'll be in the show notes of last episode there is a complete mind map yes there is a mind map of the episode of mind maps and i look at this and i still don't know why it exists i'm happy it does because it's nice that somebody would put the work in but i just don't get what the mind map is doing Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but i think we both feel that way yep i'm on board with you and then a question that i couldn't ignore from burn on twitter so if you look at the original image of adina's work there is some blue writing mm-hmm. and burn has asked what the pen is that adina is using for oh. <laughs> you can't pass up any kind of pen question cannot <laughs> so she is using uh what is known as the twisby mini fountain pen a company called twisby mm-hmm. who makes these and she's also using an ink called pilot iroshizuku konpeki I will put links mm-hmm. to those in the show notes. They both come with thorough recommendations from me. Can't pass up a pen question. Nope. You're a pen addict. That's what you are. You could say that, yes. <laughs> Many people do. In last week's episode, we touched upon a couple of things about starting new projects and building a side business. And they were kind of just mm-hmm. in the middle of the bigger conversation. But mm-hmm. people seem to really lash onto them. There's been a lot of really interesting conversation happening on the Reddit about this. And I wanted to talk more about that today because it seems to have been something that has sparked something in people's minds and it's something that we both have very strong opinions on one way Mm -hmm. or another. There was one really great comment, uh, a very long comment on the Reddit by uh, Reddit user Alien Turned Human. And I've picked out a couple of sections of this that I want to read out and then we can discuss them because I think that Mm -hmm. there's some really interesting questions about it. And this is mainly in regards to starting something new. So we were talking about the fact that tools, the tools these days to create what you create are a lot more advanced and free in many instances. Yeah, the tools that both of us use because uh, as you touched upon, you used GarageBand for a while for podcasting and that comes free with a apple computer now doesn't it it does yeah this is not just for you're making youtube videos this is for you're doing almost anything on the internet the tools are free and or way cheaper than the equivalents would have been a while back so that's kind of the the starting point of this conversation so this is from that comment so it starts off with on the issue of starting a youtube channel being easier or harder today i would answer both clearly a literal interpretation of this question means that it's easier because as gray very correctly states the means to produce content is easier than ever even compared to five years ago however when people ask the question that's not really the question they're asking what they're asking is about starting a highly successful youtube channel like the next v source mm-hmm. so my i will pose the question to you do you believe it is easier or harder to start a successful youtube channel in 2015 yeah, Vsauce has just over 9 million subscribers now. I don't even know what this channel's about. It's an educational YouTube channel. Okay. So I'm just looking at his uh, his videos here. So say something like, is the earth actually flat? What is the speed of dark? Or I think one of, uh, one of the ones I remember off the top of my head was, uh, what is the color of a mirror? But I think his, his style is mostly well known for using that question as a jumping off point and very often going on to several 
tangents. So his videos are often a lot like three different videos right. in one. Okay. So he's an educational channel. Well, I wanted to look up the numbers as well because as a groundwork underneath this conversation, I'm not sure how much there is to be gained from looking at the top, top people in an attention-oriented field. I mean, uh, Vsauce has got to be in the top hundred or so of all channels on YouTube. And when you start talking about the people at the absolute apex, like gigantic numbers, if that's what you're thinking about, those are people who have to have everything go right for them, yeah. practically by definition. Now, where are you in that list? Yeah, I, well, uh, I can tell you, actually. There is uh, a website called VidStatX, which people use to uh, track all this stuff. So let me see. Okay, yeah, so if we look at uh, Vsauce very quickly, his subscriber rank is number 45 on YouTube. <laughs> That's high up. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's why, like, if this if this is the the level that you're talking about, it's a crazy number. Yeah. Is this is um? There's a very very strong chance you're not going to do that. It's a it's it's a bit like saying, "How do I be Chris Pratt?" Right? Like, well, <laughs> I, I don't mean this as a joke, but there's a very different conversation between how do I become a working actor, right? And and how do I become one of the most successful people in the world, right? And like, well. You can't engineer that. You know, like Chris Pratt had to have everything go right to mm -hmm. be Chris Pratt. Uh, okay, so for comparison here, uh, if you're looking at me, so right now, oh, my subscriber number is up to uh, 1.8 million subscribers, and that puts me at uh, number 650 on all of YouTube. Which is still incredibly high, by the way. Congratulations on that. Yeah, it's it's still very high, but again, if you if you're looking at um, subscriber numbers, it's this asymptotic graph. This power law always always happens. So when you look at the top people, they're just these crazy crazy numbers. And let's let me just see, just for comparison here, if we do, when do you start getting below a million subscribers? Just as our our ballpark here, if you have a million subscribers as your mark of success, there are fourteen hundred channels on YouTube with a million or more subscribers right now. Right, and that, that puts this into a very different ball game because at a million, you are highly successful, right? That is a, you look at that number, that is a big number. But yeah. in terms of relative to other YouTubers, it isn't so much. Let's say YouTube is having a party and they want to invite the most popular kids, right? They're starting at this list and there's a long way down until you get to people who have let's say three quarters of a million is more than 2,000 people now before you get down to uh, people who have 775,000 subscribers, right? It's just the numbers get very, very strange. But then, of course, the, the graph starts to level out very fast as well when you start talking about the lower, lower numbers. Mm -hmm. But so anyway, th that's just what I wanted to kind of lay out there is there's a big difference between when people think of successful YouTubers Right, they'll think of someone like Michelle Fan, right, who's, who has like a like an empire now that she has built from YouTube, and she's one of the most popular YouTubers. Or they'll think of Vsauce, or they'll think of PewDiePie, and that's a very, very different thing from saying how how likely is it that you can make a living on YouTube, which is already an unlikely thing, but is a it's a very, very different ball game. That's an incredibly long run up to my answer, which is that I still think that if you are defining success in terms of you are able to make a living on YouTube, it is easier to do now than it was, say, five years ago, which is you know often what people will say, oh, you should have started five years ago. Why do you think that, though? All right, one of the reasons I think that is the case is because the audience of people on YouTube is also much, much bigger. So there is more human time and attention to go around. Whereas when you talk about YouTube in you know, 2008 or 2009, the number of people looking at YouTube videos were, were much smaller. So as YouTube has grown in profile, there are more people looking at YouTube videos, which means there is more 
potential desire for things to watch from a much, much broader audience of people. Whereas when you go back in the day to when YouTube started, it was a much smaller audience and it was also a much more narrow audience. Like it was almost certainly way more nerdy on average when YouTube just begins than it is now. Whereas now it's, it's say you can say that there's just, there are YouTube channels on everything because everybody watches YouTube. There's a lot of room for people to make a living in a bunch of different fields. Because the tools have gotten cheaper over time and because the audience has broadened over time, there are more spaces for people to occupy if they want to be making a living in the world where they have to aggregate human attention in some way. I think a good example actually is, is we made an allusion to it uh, earlier, but you have a podcast about pens. What is that podcast called, Mike? It's called The Pen Addict. It's called The Pen Addict. This is always a great example to me of a podcast because I find it hilarious that a show that is about pens can exist yep. for two reasons. One, I'm not surprised that there is in some ways enough of an audience who wants to listen to a podcast about pens, but I'm also surprised that there is enough to talk about every week in the world of pens that is that is also of interest to me like i don't know what you guys talk about every week it is many times easier to find things to talk about on the pen addict than it is to find things to talk about on our tech shows that's amazing to me because there's more that happens just every week this to me gets to the core of the thing about the internet that i just love which is people that have interests in niche topics can aggregate together and be really interested in those topics and and the they sort of generate for themselves things to talk about and industry and goings on and i think that's just that is just amazing to me just taking the pen addict as an example if we rewind to back when there was just radio programs it is very unlikely that any radio station anywhere ever could make a show about pens financially successful it can't exist there's no way for it to exist it can't exist in any kind of financial model because of, of limited time for broadcasting it's just so so many reasons why it didn't it it couldn't possibly work now on the internet if you have a narrow interest but that a narrow interest when you look at the whole of the human population and you say are there enough people interested in this to be able to put together a podcast or put together a show on this topic? If the answer is yes, that's a possibility for you, right? That's a thing that can be done. And so as we have gotten more and more people online and we have gotten more and more people used to the idea of watching video online or listening to podcasts uh, through the internet, as you bring all of this human attention to this internet world, there is more opportunity for people to start new things that aggregate human attention. People talk about YouTube getting too big, and I always feel like it, but it's good if it's really big. You want it to be really big. That's that's what enables lots of crazy stuff to exist in all in all kinds of fields. It's it is that enormous audience that is there. That argument makes sense to me. I hadn't really thought of it in that way. I mean, my my thinking when I was thinking about YouTube was just it does seem like it might be harder and, and there is an elephant in the room which is production quality which we'll get to in a minute because I think mm. they're slightly di different discussions but I can mm. I can totally see what you're getting at as there are more people it works out and that's what we're seeing in podcasting now there is more and more people coming to podcasting and there is a general belief that that will help everyone out but in regards to what makes a successful podcast, the numbers and everything are very different and a lot more tricky. There isn't mm -hmm. a centralized database to of comparison with numbers out front and center. If anything, um, the podcast industry keeps numbers quite close to its chest. People mm -hmm. are, uh, they, they just don't really share them as much because they're not public. So people keep them to themselves. It's the biggest thing that I have to get used to when I'm doing podcasts in addition to doing YouTube is... I am so used to everybody knows exactly where everybody else stands because all the YouTube data is public. And I find it really frustrating in the podcast world of it's it's hard to get a sense of 
how big are the biggest shows or what is the minimum number of listeners that a show needs to survive all everybody keeps their keeps their cards real close to the chest in the podcast world and i find that uh, just a very different culture uh, than the youtube culture so from my experience of this stuff a podcast starts to become traditionally successful when it breaks the 10,000 a week numbers like on average you know that's what it's getting every week i've i have found that that is when it's it becomes easier to get advertisement and stuff like that at, at that sort of level. Yeah, so, so that's when sponsors start taking your calls is when you get to get into the 10,000 a week numbers. Yeah, that's what I have found. And mm-hmm. other people say different things. But from my experience, that's when you can kind of try and get your foot in the door. It's when people will take mm-hmm. you seriously. Mm-hmm. But it isn't until the multiple tens of thousands number before a podcast becomes a, a level where it could support you financially. Because the rates, I mean, look, the advertising rates, it's like an infinite scale higher than YouTube. Yes. The the amount that you can charge per thousand people, known as a CPM, uh, for podcasting on YouTube is just insanely different to the point that I really don't even understand why YouTube is as low as it is. Because it works for the podcasting industry and advertisers are happy with the rates that they pay. But for some reason... Mm -hmm. I mean, because, you know, you even see it like in people that do traditional advertising when I, you know, as in like how we do advertising on this show, people that do advertising like that in YouTube videos make more money than the YouTube ads. But it's the same thing. It's very confusing, very confusing to me. Um, But it's that is where it starts to get financially viable is in the multiple tens of thousands level. That's where people can start to turn it into a career. Uh, but I think that success comes at around the 10,000 mark because at that point you are far and above many of the other like hobbyist podcasts that exist Mm -hmm. because the NPR stuff and the Gimlet stuff and all of that, that is a whole different world. It's a different ball game. It's coming from a different place in my opinion. And that is astronomically large and and requires different levels of of popularity and many independent people can get to that level but it's extremely hard to do that Mm -hmm. um but yeah that's what i think the success levels differ between youtube and podcasting um because of the numbers and the way it all works out and the relative audience like maximum audience size there are way more people that watch youtube videos and listen to podcasts so it, it skews it slightly differently but that's kind of where it sits I mean, it depends on a lot of details, but my uh, the threshold that I used to use for for minimum YouTube success was around 200,000 subscribers. It's an order of magnitude larger than is necessary in the podcast world, but it's also because the advertising rates are at least an order of magnitude less on YouTube. So that's why there's such a disparity there that you need to aggregate a much much larger audience on youtube to sustain yourself than you do on podcasts because of the way the advertising rates work a two hundred thousand episode podcast is a phenomenal success it's just such a different world but i echo your statement that i think that because of the growing market of podcast listeners it is easier to get to be successful Mm. however the flip side of it, which still does apply, is as it becomes more popular, it becomes harder because there are less new ideas. There are more and more people having ideas and that will become successful. So the thing for you to try and come up with something that makes you unique becomes harder as there are more people doing it because your competition increases. That's the hard part is the being creative but I don't think that that is an inherent problem with the industry. It's just you as a human being need to be more creative of what you're looking to create. Yeah, I mean, yes. But again, but again, business advice in the YouTube podcast world is is not like business advice anywhere else because YouTube and podcasts are so heavily personality and entertainment based that it makes them unlike other products. And so it's not necessarily that you have to come up with a great idea that nobody has come up with before. If you can just be an entertaining person, someone that people like watching on YouTube videos or some or someone that people like listening to on podcasts, 
it sometimes doesn't really matter what your idea for the show is. I mean, YouTube is filled with this, this whole world that I don't pay a lot of attention to, but of young vloggers who don't have any set topic. They're just talking about whatever, but they're able to do it in a way that is interesting to their audience. But the idea of, oh, I'm just going to talk about random stuff this week on my YouTube channel, like that's not a, that's not a new idea. There are lots and lots of people who do that for a living because the real thing that is being kind of sold to the audience is a, a short video that is entertaining to watch because the person's funny or maybe because the person is just likable or for, for whatever reason. It's not necessarily a, a unique idea that is, is being on offer there as... In the same way that if you're if you're manufacturing something for sale, it definitely helps if you're able to come up with something that is new and unique that that people want. It's a very different kind of thing. See that that is a whole other problem, right? W being entertaining. That is, you know, <laughs> like how it, you can't learn that. Is it a case of you either are or you aren't, or what? Like, how does that? I, you know, it's difficult. Yeah, it's it's very difficult. This is this is a perennial topic of conversation uh, among some people. Is is the is it just a natural thing to be entertaining, or is it a thing that is learned? You know, I definitely come down on on the the side of it's something that people can get better at, but that's very different from saying could you take someone who is zero percent entertaining and ever get them up to fifty percent entertaining, versus someone who is starting at say. 30% can you get them to 60%? Like we all know people who are starting at 0% entertaining and I'm not sure that you can ever teach some people to do that. I, I don't know if that is actually possible to do. And if you want to have a career in public in the way that podcasts and YouTube videos are, there is no doubt about it that entertaining is a necessary, a necessary part of the equation. And uh, I remember when I made my first, my very first YouTube video, which now I can't watch because <laughs> I hate the production quality of it, the UK Explained video. And in it, I had a couple of jokes. And I remember one of the earlier pieces of feedback that I got from a bunch of people was people saying, oh, I liked the video, but it would have been better if you didn't put in those little jokes. Like, why couldn't you just have it be a straightforward explanation video. Why do you have to do the couple of diversions into little little jokes here and there? And I remember that's really struck me at the time that I felt, oh, you know what? They probably were right that these little these little side tangents, I, I probably shouldn't do that. But even though that's how I thought at first, I have realized later on, like, no, that is absolutely this is absolutely vital. If people just wanted to straight up know the information. It's like, well, I can hand you a Venn diagram of the overlap of, of the UK and how everything fits together. And it, it conveys the same amount of information in way less time than, than my video does. But I think one of the reasons that my videos are successful is because people find them entertaining. I think there has to be a level of entertainment. But the problem is it's it's not even really something we can have a discussion about because... You can't label it. You can't buy a box of entertainment or download right. it. Like it's, and it sounds so like, oh, look at us, we're so entertaining. But I don't think that I'm entertaining, as I'm sure you probably don't necessarily believe that you are entertaining, but people are entertained by us anyway. Yeah, well, this is what we discussed a little bit last time, or maybe two episodes ago, that I am not able to see where other people find my videos funny until I watch my wife watch a video and then I can see where the funny parts are so it's it's a strange thing because I don't even know how I do it like I, I and I always think that my videos aren't funny until I see someone watch them and that's why it's like you know what this is a kind of difficult conversation to have because entertainment is a necessary part of wide-scale success in a in an attention field like YouTube or like podcasts but it is also the part that I have the least understanding of how I incorporate it into my own work. Like, I just, I just don't even know. <laughs> That's why when people talk about success on YouTube, it's just, it's very, very different from other, other kinds of things. But, but putting the, the, like, can you be entertaining 
uh, question aside, I still say that if you want to start a career on YouTube, it is easier now than it was in the past. And I, I violently disagree with this idea that it would have been better to start five years ago. Because that, that to me is a bit like wishing. It's like, well, yeah, had you started five years ago, you would be in a better position now than you are right now. But that's a bit like me saying, oh man, I wish I had started dieting and exercising five years ago. It's like, well, yeah, I would be in a much better position now had I done that. But it doesn't change the fact that today is the best day to start on that if it is a goal that I'm, I'm trying to achieve. Hey everyone, let me take a quick break here to just thank our friends over at Fracture for helping support Cortex today. A trillion photos will be taken in 2015, and Fracture is here to rescue your favorite moments from the dark corners of your camera roll or an Instagram timeline or something like that. Fracture is transforming the way that people print and display their favorite images, and they do it in a really unique way that I love. It's super simple. You upload a picture to FractureMe.com and they don't just make an amazing print of it, they make an amazing print of your photo directly onto a piece of glass. I have no idea how they do this, it feels kind of a little bit like magic, but either way, it's fantastic. And once you receive your great, amazing, beautiful photo print on this lovely piece of glass, you'll want to mount it on the wall to display to the world. Now when you put it up, this isn't going to look like another frame that you have in your house with you know a picture behind a piece of glass with some wood around it no there is no frame to it what you are hanging on the wall is your beautiful photo with a nice piece of glass protecting it it's all stuck together it looks amazing i really can't speak highly enough and when you do want to put it on that wall you'll have everything you need as fracture will put a little screw in the box so you can just put it straight up on the wall no frame needed because the fracture print is all and in itself, the frame, the photo, everything in between. You really will want to see this for yourself. I love these prints so much. They are so awesome. They come in different sizes. They have rectangle shapes and square shapes as well. The rectangle ones go all the way up to 21 by 28 inch. And the square sizes are really great for Instagram photos, podcast artwork, album covers, app icons, that kind of stuff. And you can get a little stand of those ones if you want. So you can pop them on your desk. The colors all look great. They really bring your photos to life in a brand new way that I think you're going to love. Now I could sit here and talk to you all day about how much I love my fracture prints that were made in Florida and shipped all the way over to me in the UK with absolutely not a scratch on any seven of them. But the best thing you should be doing right now is going and trying it out for yourself. You can get yourself 15% off your first order with the coupon code Cortex and their prices start at just $15 so it's not going to break the bank either. Go to FractureMe.com to get started right now. Thank you so much to Fracture for their support of this show. Okay, let's move on to the other part of this, which I think by now is an elephant in the room, which is production standards. So uh, the Reddit comment continues. The increases in competition means higher standards of production are now required. If there is any barrier to entry for the viewer to enjoy your content, particularly on a technical level when it comes to video or audio quality, a lot of people will move on because they have other options where this is not the case. That's not to say that if you produce something that is exceptional in terms of everything else just recorded on a poor microphone and camera that people won't see through it. However, it does reduce the chance people will give it the time that it deserves. So, do you think that production levels are a barrier to entry for higher success <sighs> see I, but i have i have a problem with the way that question is even phrased okay listen i i always i always say this thing that i think is definitionally true which is that people will watch a video because it is good and, and i mean good in the sense of of they draw something out of that video and so in some sense, any video that gets a huge number of views, no matter how dumb you might think it is or how low the technical production is, there's something good in it that the viewers are enjoying, right? That they are they are watching. I have seen very, very funny stuff on YouTube that has terrible, terrible production values. But the thing that it is offering to me is that it can make me laugh. And and the rest of the rest of it 
is not relevant. The production values are not relevant if it makes me laugh. It just doesn't. It just doesn't matter. If you start a video and it sounds bad or looks bad, do you even get to the laughter point? See, that's the problem, right? I mean, because I can kind of understand this. Like, I think that with podcasting. I think podcasting is even harsher than YouTube because with YouTube, there are two points. You can get the video right and the or the audio right. But with podcasting, mm-hmm. with audio podcasting, you have one thing. You have mm-hmm. to sound good, I think. And, but the barrier to entry for this is not massive. I mean, there is still a money investment. You can get uh, a good microphone like the Blue Yeti for under $100, which is still a lot of money, but it's not an incredible amount of money. It is a small percentage of the amount of money that my current setup has for arguably a small difference in quality to many people. Uh, But it's the setup that I like to use because I like the way I sound with it. Um, Mm -hmm. But you can kind of get into it and have a good microphone that produces good audio for a relatively small amount of money. But, you know, I think that's important. But with YouTube, you, there, there are two parts of it. And, and if it doesn't sound good or doesn't look good, will you continue? I don't know. Okay, look, again, I make the argument that production values don't matter as much as people think they do. I, I swear, I think this is something that people like to focus on as a, as a kind of pre-built barrier to not starting. Right? They, they look at the high production values of people who have been doing stuff for years and think, oh, I could never get a video to look like that, and so I'm, I'm not going to start making a video. But the people who've been doing stuff for a long time, rarely does, does their stuff look like that when it started. What matters is that you have something that people want to pay attention to when you start it. And in the podcast world, I'll use the, the classic example of totally crap audio, but still very entertaining. Can you guess what podcast I'm going to name, Mike? The Flop House? I am going to name the Flophouse, which has some of the worst audio you will ever hear on a podcast. It's horrible. But you know what? People get through it because they are very entertaining guys talking about terrible, terrible movies in a very funny way. And I listen to that podcast, and that gets some of the deepest laughs out of Mm -hmm. me of anything that I ever listen to. The Flophouse reminds me of The Wire. Okay. Okay. Please tell, please tell me how you're going to go with it. Go with me on this. Okay. In the same way that when you first watch The Wire, you have to watch a couple of episodes to kind of get it and to be able mm-hmm. to stick with it. I find The Flop House to be like that. You have to commit to a couple of them to look past its foibles in that. Right. Sometimes it's it would be deemed unlistenable in many other areas, right? But you can kind of get past it because it is incredibly entertaining. Right. And even over time, the Flophouse has gotten better with their audio. Yeah. I mean, they still they still sound like three guys sitting around a single microphone for some unknown reason. But they even they have gotten better because over time, they had something that people were willing to pay attention to. And so then you can make it better as, as you go on. And I think this is the same thing for starting a YouTube channel, right, is start your YouTube channel. See if you have a core of anything that people are willing to pay attention to. And if if you go back and you go back and you look at any YouTubers now, their first videos, they are always lower quality than what they're doing now. But nonetheless, the people who are still making a living on YouTube, almost without exception, you can look at their first video and you can say, yes, the technical quality of this might not be the best, but there is something there that is interesting or engaging or entertaining in some way. You can see that there's like a little core of what it can eventually be. If you look back at Minute Physics first video, you know, his his tone of speaking is much slower. It's much less entertaining, but nonetheless, he's still sort of got some attention with it and turned it into a thing like all yours oh, yeah you can look at you can look at mine i don't know if you've ever seen it but have you ever seen uh mkbhd's first video yeah it is adorable yeah. because he's like 12 years old and he's reviewing the like a dvr or something <laughs> but nonetheless you can look at this 12 year old kid explaining the dvr and i still say he does it better than other videos I've seen on YouTube. It's like, okay, obviously it's not great, but you can tell there's something there about he's explaining it through in a methodical way. 
<laughs> then you can you can watch those videos over time and see him grow up into the professional YouTuber he is today. Everybody's videos are like that. You just you don't start out amazing. It's very very rare to start out just absolutely amazing. I'm not convinced that production values matter as much as people think they do. I just think it's an easy, concrete thing for people to focus on that distracts them from starting the actual project that they want to start. You need, you need to think of it like the venture capital world, right? You need a minimum viable project. If you want to start a YouTube channel, you start your YouTube channel and start filming stuff and just see, do you get any kind of reaction from people? Do you get any kind of feedback from people? If you don't, that's probably not a good sign, but then you can try doing something, try doing something different. Like at least you have gained valuable information instead of just sitting thinking like, oh, maybe one day I'll do this thing. As well, like I think that there is a real benefit in being able from a production level to just start small and then build up. Mm -hmm. Like, as you see from your video and from MKBHD's first video, starting at a very bare minimum and then building up the cameras and the audio and the planning that goes into it, you build that up over time and it gives you a ramp through to your success. You start with nobody, right? So you should start mm -hmm. with very basic equipment and then build it over time as your potential audience will build along with you. Yeah, and, and if the thing is a successful thing, it, it starts to make sense to invest in it over time. I was just trying to find it. There's a, there's a, a video that Derek Veritasium did, which is called How to Start a YouTube Channel. And uh, I'll send it to you for the show notes. But in there, he, he talks about some of the similar stuff, but he also shows some clips of some of his earlier videos that just... And he talks about the like the things that he learned from those earlier videos of starting a video fast or production qualities. And it's just it's very interesting to see someone show you these little moments of them like not being so great. But nonetheless, like he's doing this now because even those not so great videos had a core of interestingness to them that was able to attract some audience that he was able to snowball over time. Uh, into into a, a full career now. Should we talk tough of our listeners now, Gray? Uh, okay, maybe. If you're using these things as reasons that you're not making the podcast or YouTube video that you want to make, you need to just get over it and do it. Because if these are the if if you feel this way, like if you have this thing that you want to make, but you're like, oh, it's going to be too difficult because of the I don't have a red camera. Oh, it's too it's too difficult because there's already a million people. The only reason that you're not successful is because you're not making it. You can't be successful unless you make it. So you actually have to just go and make it. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely true. I mean, this is the the just start advice is the kind of advice that I find true and also kind of useless advice. Um, like I'm never quite sure who the target audience is of this because. The people who just start stuff do just start stuff. This is this has always been my experience. Like maybe you can give them a little bit of a push, but for the most part, they're going they're going to do it on their own. And from talking to people, you know, when I hear people talking about production qualities or getting started or these these kinds of difficulties, I don't think the people who talk about that necessarily realize that they're using it as a kind of built-in excuse to not get started. Like I, I've just, I'm not sure, I'm not sure that there is any direct value to be gained from that, that kind of just start advice. Well, this is why we need to talk tough to them, Gray. We need to kick them in the pants, you know. So now they know that it's an excuse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're gonna tell them to just start, but you're gonna say it louder. <laughs> is that, yeah, is that what you're gonna do? I'll do that. That's what I'll do. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe I'll just loop it for the there next ten minutes. You know, just me saying, "Just start over and over again." Have you seen that Shia LaBeouf video? Did, you must yeah. have seen this video. <laughs> yeah, it's it's the one where he's on the green screen, just just screaming, "Just do it!" Yep. just get started. Yep. That that man's whole career is, I think, an amazing piece of performance art. Yes, <laughs> like I'm not sure what you're up to, Shia LaBeouf. <laughs> <laughs> At least I hope that's the case. <laughs> this is my. This is how I choose to interpret his career. I guess I should say one of the reasons why this this topic kind of frustrates me is because I feel like as for as long as I have been doing YouTube, I have been hearing people say how now is harder than ever. I, I remember prominent YouTubers saying 
before I started my YouTube career in 2011, that it was pretty much impossible for, for new people to come along because you, know, you have all of these big players who are already established and it's very, very difficult for new people to get started. And I feel like I, I was hearing that in 2011 and I've been hearing that every year about how, oh, now it's, you know, it's just way harder and the production qualities are higher. But new people still keep coming along. And I want to use it uh, like as a bit of an example is um, the YouTube channel Kyrgyzat, which is doing very well. Like they are new right? they're from two years ago. Uh, they're a team of people actually who work together to make a video. But people have said like, oh, the, no one can possibly break into the, the YouTube educational space because it's already been like it's it's all been homesteaded. Right. All the plots of land have been divided. And and the people who were there back in 2011, you know, will, will own it for forever. But like, no, Kyrgyzat started relatively new and he's doing very well. He's approaching a million subscribers uh, as we record this this episode. There's always there's always room for someone who is good and who is putting a lot of work into it. I think there's just there's always space for for somebody who is new because there's always going to be churn. Yeah, exactly. It's a bit like saying, oh, there'll never be any new actors in Hollywood because we have all of the actors now. It's like, well, it's not, this isn't how this works. It doesn't work like this in any field. I don't understand why people talk about YouTube as though it's it's different in this way. We have Chris Pratt. We don't need anybody else. <laughs> right, right. We're never going to need another charming leading man. Right. We're done. We're you know we're all we're all closed up. You know, and if an amazing talent comes along, we're just going to leave him out in the cold in the rain to be a hobo. That's not how this works. I'm very proud of your current pop culture reference that you, you willed out today. Bob. I was really trying hard to think of, like, who can I mention? <laughs> like, I've had a, I need a name. What name? Like, oh, I saw Guardians of the Galaxy a while ago. Like, it was a dude. He had a funny name. It was Chris Pratt. Okay, great. Because <laughs> he really is the person you would bring up. So you did really well. I'm proud of you. Great. I'm, ve I'm, I'm very pleased about that. The other thing just about this is when people look at YouTube channels, I, I've seen some people try to argue with data about the existing channels and how long ago they were started. Like, I would actually be really curious to have someone say, I don't know if you could do this, but scrape all the data off of uh, VidStatX and say, what is the median year of start for the top thousand YouTube channels, for example? And I would still expect that to be relatively old, even if I'm saying it's easier now to get started than it ever has been, because this is how survivorship bias works. Like you, you should expect that the people who were successful are more likely to also be successful next year. And so the average successful YouTube channel you should expect to be around for quite a while even if it still is easier for new channels to get started than ever, because you also have the field just growing over time. But that doesn't, that's not to argue that the people who have already been around don't have some kind of lead or that they don't have this survivorship bias. It's like, yes, it is. I've been making videos for several years. And if you had to put bets on it, it's like, I can probably still make videos next year. Like I, I do still have an audience and I'm still I'm still making stuff, but I'd be very curious to see the actual data on that. But I don't feel that a, that uh, if the data came back and said, "Oh, the median channel was created three years ago, four years ago, five years ago," I don't feel like that would necessarily counter it, because you run into the same thing with with mutual funds in the stock market that the average age of mutual funds is quite old, and it's like, well, it's not really surprising though, because the ones that didn't make it they went bankrupt and you remove them from the pool. I feel like I've said all I need to say and probably you feel the same, but I feel like we're not done with this. <laughs> this is going to come up again. The thing is, Mike, I just, feel, I just feel all agitated. I just feel all agitated now because I was trying to prepare for this topic a little bit and I just feel that I have actually wandered all over the place. Well, I think it's something that we both feel quite emotional about. Um, so it's likely going to move around a lot, and I expect that you'll have many things that you'll want to say next time once you've heard this. Hmm. Yeah, I'm almost certainly going to listen back to this edit and be very, very unhappy and cut out lots of stuff. I'll warn you that in advance. This episode's 10 minutes long. Yeah, this is why I, I demanded final veto control <laughs> over what goes up, because I'm, I'm sure I'm going to listen to myself and think, oh, what an idiot, and just cut out a whole bunch of things. 
So I hope you have something else to talk about. I do. Thank God. <laughs> so something that goes kind of hand in hand with the previous discussion is the building mm-hmm. a side business type stuff. Because we had a few questions about that as well, because we were both talking about how we built our side businesses a bit last week and how we approached that with our current jobs at that time, our full-time work. So Philip asked, how do you motivate yourself to do the business when you're exhausted from your full-time job? It's like, how do you come home at 6 p.m. and then work another six hours when you've worked a full day? The answer is you don't. Don't do that at all. That's a terrible idea. For all of the various side projects that I have attempted, I did them before work. Oh. Because (laughs) that O sounded really sad there. No, no. (laughs) That seems weird to me. What time did you start? Uh... Well, I mean, it, it would depend, but here's the way I looked at it. I tried to do stuff after work, but you are exhausted after work. Do you want to know why? Because you've been working all day. E- even if you haven't been working very hard, right? You have some, some office job where you can relatively slack and you're just, your job is actually to try and hide from your boss most of the day. Like, it's still just exhausting. Like you've been doing stuff, you've done a commute and you get home and you're tired. And you know what you want to do? You want to watch TV and you want to eat ice cream, right? Like that's what's just going to happen. And science now shows us that your brain is literally drained of all of the executive chemicals it requires to actually make you do stuff. And so I feel like I learned very quickly this habit about myself of, you know what, you're never going to do anything that's really interesting or good if you're trying to do it after work. You're always going to be tired. And looking back on the previous weeks of trying to do stuff after work, like, is there any evidence that you're ever going to do anything good in the in the evenings? No. The answer is no. I couldn't disagree with you more, but carry on. <laughs> well, I'm just talking for myself here. That's why I'll, I'll see how you come in here. But this was this was the thing that I learned from myself, that it just wasn't happening. And so, as usual, I tried to approach it from a, from a systems perspective. And I said, you know what? Instead, I'm not going to give my best hours to my employer first. I'm going to wake up earlier in the morning and focus on my side projects then. And then I'm going to go to work and my employer can get what's left over. And that's, <laughs> that's how I arranged it. You get the dregs. <laughs> exactly. It's like I'm, I'm going to try to do... I mean, it doesn't have to be a huge amount of time. I think I usually did, well, except for some client stuff, which was a little crazy, but I I would usually just try to do like an hour and a half's worth of work for myself before actually going into work. And that stuff just builds up over time. And and so, yes, like I, I did almost all of that UK video was in the mornings, right, before I went into into teaching is when I did the vast majority of putting that together. And the same with my other side projects. I did them before work because I just knew in the evenings I wasn't going to do it. So my answer is, how do you motivate yourself? The answer is, I, I don't really believe in motivation. I don't, like, I don't think it, it works. Like, I don't think you can watch a video of Shia LaBeouf yelling at you and then you feel like, okay, well, man, I'm going to get to work right now because he motivated me. I think you have to rearrange things in a systemic way that allows you to work better. But you disagree, so I want to hear what you have to say. Right. So I did all of my work in the evenings. And <laughs> <laughs> how, Mike? How? Because if I did have to do it in the morning, there would be nothing. You're not a morning person? It doesn't matter how early I get up, I wouldn't be able to do anything before work in the morning. It would mm-hmm. be just basically me just falling asleep and waking up again for two hours it's probably what it would be i i'm not a morning person i'm mm. i am a better morning person now but that's because the type of work that i do in the morning is very light now <laughs> you know mm-hmm. i'm reading twitter and looking at email in the morning for two hours before i start anything else and mm-hmm. uh I found that I could be productive. I mean, I think that I was definitely conserving energy, but I I did work hard enough that I was considered to be good at my day job. So I was it wasn't like I was just sitting there and doing nothing all day. Mm. But my my answer is just the motivation for the dream, man. Like that's what it was. I loved it. And that's why I was you know last week last time I was talking about find the thing that you love and not necessarily the thing that you're good at. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, I remember you saying that. So that that's what I'm talking about. Like because if it's the thing that you love, like if you would if you would do it because you enjoy it and it's like a hobby as much as it is a thing that you enjoy, I feel it helps. It really really helps motivate you when it's 
two a.m. in the morning and you're still editing and you have to be up again in seven hours to or in six hours to to get ready for work again. I think you're wrong about you, Mike. I think you're wrong about you. You're saying there that it's it's the motivation of the thing that you love, but you also you did the same thing I did in some ways, which is that if you you knew that if you were getting up early in the morning that you wouldn't be able to do any good work, right? Yeah. So in a sense, you could reverse this guy's question to say, oh, if you had to get up at four in the morning to start work on your side project, how would you motivate yourself to do it? I think your answer then would be, uh, I wouldn't. I would be in a sleepy fog all morning. You are just for whatever reason that your brain and physiology are different from mine, that you are able to still do good work in the evenings in a way that I found that I was not able to do it. So I don't think it's necessarily that it's, it's that it's the motivation there. It's that you too found that you were able to work at that time and produce quality things. Well, yeah, I mean, that is part of it, but I still think the motivation is a big factor. It is because if you weren't motivated because you enjoyed the YouTube videos or for whatever reason you had your motivation, you would never have woke up in the morning and given those extra hours of work. Like, why would you do that? I mean, yes, it's true in that sense that I was motivated to become a self-employed person. But I think that's a slightly different question from how do you motivate yourself to work when you are tired? And the answer is that I have never found anything that is an effective answer to that. That that my my answer is more of of managing all of the schedule to minimize the overlap of I need to work and also I am very tired mm. and I am very worn out. That that's that's a different question of like of I am I mean I have motivation in the sense of I am a human with motivations that drive my actions. Like yes, in that sense I am I am motivated, but I do not have an answer for I am worn out. How do I still produce quality work? The answer is there's not enough coffee in the world to fix that. Like, it's just, you have to rearrange the schedule or the order that you do things. Well, I hope that helped, Philip. <laughs> I don't know if we if we did. I think we both think we helped, but I don't know if either of us did. <laughs> my, my, my advice is very clear. Hopefully, you have the physiology of a morning person and get up earlier. And my advice is very clear. Find the thing that you love and do that. This episode is brought to you by Squarespace. When it comes to giving yourself a place online, there's nowhere better than Squarespace. They put all the power you need in your hands and take away the pain points, like worrying about hosting, scaling, or what to do if you get stuck. With Squarespace, you can build a site that looks professionally designed regardless of skill level, no coding required. With their intuitive and easy to use tools, you can make a website look and feel exactly how you want. Their site templates are stunning to look at, and I speak from personal experience here, highly customizable. In addition to looking great, Squarespace has a ton of awesome features like 24-7 support with live chat and email. They have teams located in New York, Dublin, and Portland to help you wherever you are. They have a built-in commerce platform if you want to, say, start some kind of side business that is selling things. It's really everything that you need from a website provider. So if there is some idea for a website or a side business that has been knocking around in your brain, start today with Squarespace. It's a free trial, no credit card required. Just sign up today by going to squarespace.com. And when you do decide to use them permanently, make sure to use the offer code CORTEX to get 10% off your first purchase, and show your support for Cortex. We thank Squarespace for their support of this show and all of Relay FM. Squarespace. Build it beautiful. Died101 on the Reddit asked, "Uh, What percentage of your income did you generate from your side jobs before you were able to confidently quit your job? I don't know if Gray will answer this question. Yeah, you go first with this one. So I never thought of the side income as an income. I treated the podcasting money as if it was just free money because I never wanted to rely on it. So it was just like, this is just the money and I'd spend that on whatever, but I never really considered it as this is what I earn. I always considered as what I earn and what I budgeted with to be the salary that I received. And then when it came time for me to decide I wanted to quit, I took a look at the income that I received from my bank job. And then as soon as I felt I could match that with the podcasting stuff, I cut it out. 
and then made the switch. I, I get what you're saying there, but I'm, but I'm still conf- you must have had some sort of target that you wanted to hit before you left your job, right? Yeah, the target was to match my the money that I received from my full time job with podcasting money, but not the two together. What do you mean by not? I don't, I don't get this. What do you mean by not the two together? So I had two income streams, right? Right. I had my full-time job and I had my the revenue that I made from podcasting. Right. I never took those two together and called that my income. Right. I thought of my bank job as the income and the money from podcasting was just whatever money. So I tried to match my income with the podcasting money, which was just my full-time job money. Because if you put them together, it's way harder to make that number up. If you put them together, that equation is fundamentally unsolvable because you're saying, oh, I want, you know, P to be greater than P plus J. Exactly. Yeah. So you obviously would never yeah, do that. But okay, I think okay. that, that it is a common trap that people take it as their income and they think, right, this is what uh, okay. I earn. But then if you have to try and replace that, you can't do that. It's basically impossible. Mm-hmm. You have to have some sort of monumental explosion of revenue overnight, which is very rare. Right, yeah. And and still, th- that equation would never solve itself, no matter how monumental your your sudden windfall was. Exactly. Okay, so, so you replaced your income before leaving, basically. That was what I did, yeah. I was in a, I was in a bit of a, a bit of a funny situation because with the way with the way my history worked, I was making a really serious push towards self-employment in my final two years. And uh, my final two years of teaching, I was actually only teaching part-time. I wasn't a full-time teacher. And I was living on very, very little money. But it was a, it was a gamble to get more time for myself to work on side projects. Even though when I accepted the part-time job uh, at the school, I did not have any particular side project in mind. I just thought, I need to free up a couple days uh, a week where I can dedicate towards working on side projects and try to to make this work. I know that I matched the income that I was making from teaching before I left, but that income was already uh, significantly less than a normal full-time teacher would work. Um, but th- this was this was why it was it was a bit of a gamble for me. But I, I had a very clear number in my head and a spreadsheet that I was using to track it, which was 200,000 subscribers, because uh, in the time frame that I was looking, my estimate was that if I could reach 200,000 subscribers by the date that I needed to, that was enough growth that I could count on it growing more in the future to replace what would be a full-time teacher salary, if you see what I mean. Mm-hmm. Because if, if if my part-time gamble didn't pay off, I was eventually going to have to find another job that was a full-time teaching job because I couldn't live on that low of a money for an indefinite period of time. Uh, you know, I wasn't saving for retirement. I was burning through the savings that I had. It was not sustainable in the long run. So it was a real gamble roll of the dice. But I, I quit when the trajectory looked sound. And that was partly because of the horrible dynamics of when you can quit as a teacher and when you have to come back without breaking a contract. So uh, just, just very briefly, let's say it's this academic year. If you don't want to show up next academic year, you know, September 1st, you have to quit this academic year, usually by mid April. Uh, There's a, big big lag between when you're a teacher when you hand in your resignation and when you sort of when you don't come God. back so you have to yeah. quit in april to be able to leave in september of 2015 yeah to be able to not come back september 2015 so you would leave in what like june of 2015 or whatever yeah it's almost half a year is the, is the the notice that you need to have and that's why i was doing a kind of trajectory based resignation <laughs> because i couldn't I was willing at that speed of subscriber growth to make the gamble that I could leave the teaching job and it would still grow and I would be fine instead of um, missing that April date. And then what would happen is the earliest I could resign is if I handed in my resignation over the summer, 
then I would be allowed to leave in January. All right, so the, the, because there's such that that big lag, that's why I was I was trying to think about it very very far in advance. Um, but so that that's the way it worked. I wanted to hit that number two hundred thousand subscribers before April, and I did, and that was a very exciting day. And then I, I was able to hand in my resignation letter. <sighs> you okay over there? It, it, that is just such a like. It, I understand why they do that, but it, mm-hmm. it feels like you just end up with people that just can't care enough for like five months. <laughs> they've already quit i've changed jobs a couple of times with with teaching it is a weird experience to hand in your resignation letter in april and then be like well i guess i'm still here until the summer just teaching i did like a five week notice and it was terrible for everyone you, you don't think a uh, what is the equivalent of like a three month notice really is uh, is a good idea no i don't think that i think it actually it actually kind of works in the teaching world because the turnover is usually relatively small and also the commitment is much higher because even though you feel like oh i'm leaving this school you would feel just like you can't just like leave the kids that you've been working with for two-thirds of the year so you you feel much more like oh i have this this commitment to the kids that i have been teaching which is totally separate from the commitment that i have to the school as an institution I, i like i think there are reasons why this happens in the academic world in a way that it doesn't happen in the corporate world. And it would it would be crazy making if it happened in the corporate world. Uh, but it does mean that as a teacher, if you are ever planning to switch jobs, you need to think about it way in advance. You, you need to have you need to have everything set up a long time before you do it. So I have one more thing on this, uh, which came from SWFK on mm-hmm. Reddit. Uh, if you remember last time we were talking about how we firmly believe you shouldn't tell anybody about your side business uh, at your current full-time job. Yeah, at work. Don't tell anybody at work. Yep. Uh, yeah. How would you recommend simultaneously telling the world about a side project <laughs> <laughs> because you want it to gain attention whilst also keeping it a secret from the people you work with? I mean, th- this happened to work out for me. But I wouldn't recommend this path. It was, it was, I can say without doubt that my final year of teaching and trying to do YouTube on the side was the worst year of my adult life thus far. It was a terrible, terrible, stressful time. Like I wouldn't exactly like, oh, you know, this is definitely something that you should, you should aim for. Uh, like, don't, don't get me wrong. This is a high anxiety situation, no matter which way you cut it. If you're trying to do a public project on the side and keep it away from everybody else. But the only real piece of advice I have is the obvious one, which is to just not tell anyone at work. There's nothing else that you can do. And I think it's easy to suffer from, uh, I forget the name of this psychological bias, but there's, it's easy to think that everybody else is much more interested in you than they are, because of course, you are the central point of your whole world. And so it's easy to overassume how interested other people are. But if you are already employed somewhere and you're just doing your job and you're, you're a normal employee, the chances that your coworkers are still actively occasionally googling you is probably a lot lower than you think it is. Like if you're switching jobs and you're new in a place, like that probability goes way up. But if you've just been in a place for a while, I think it goes way down. So just don't tell anybody at work, even though there are many situations where it feels like a natural thing to do in a conversation maybe, like the conversation comes up and you feel like you should uh, contribute to that conversation. Uh, I just, just don't, it's, it's hard. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, you just have to keep your mouth shut. There really isn't any other, there really isn't any other advice. And the only thing I would say is that if people do discover your side project, you should always plan for some kind of plausible deniability. So I wouldn't, for example, on your website have a big announcement about how this is the thing that you hope will eventually replace your full-time job. I would always want to be able to parlay it off to any coworkers as, oh, this is a hobby. This is a thing that I do uh, just for myself on, on the internet. That's, 
that's the only advice I can give, which is probably not very helpful advice. Also, avoid giving people access to the megaphone. So, like, don't talk about your Twitter account with them if that's where you're promoting yourself. Like, right. Also, keep that stuff away from people. I did have an instance where, um, as I say, I more people knew about what I did because of the way that I got my job than mm-hmm. than with yours. Right, right, because of the marketing connection. Exactly. But it was still people that were within my immediate team, and they also maybe didn't understand the, the kind of the... the the avenues that it went down and like they didn't understand the size of what I was working on and attempting mm-hmm. to do. And then one day I received an email from someone in our legal team who had Googled me because I was emailing them about something and they just had a kid and they were thinking about names and they noticed the weird way that I spell Mike. And they Googled that, just Mike, I think. And mm. I came up <laughs> in the search term or however it was that they did it Mm. and they just started looking through and they wanted to have this big conversation with me Mm -hmm. my advice in those scenarios is act shy about it nervous about it and shut it down (laughs) end that conversation as fast as possible so you don't end up having to be in that scenario unless you want to brag about it then go ahead but i think my my advice in that scenario is just try and get out of it as quickly as possible. Yeah, I mean, this touches on on another whole topic uh, that we could talk about sometime, which is if you're doing side projects, you need to just be as anonymous as possible at work. Like, you can't, you don't want to stand out in any way precisely for like this thing that you you ran across here like your name is spelled differently so someone ended up googling you you just don't want to cross people's field of attention and i definitely remember at at my my final school there were a couple of people who i was actively making sure like i never want to cross their radar they should never have a reason to hear my name right everything should just be smooth it should just be done but i don't want to stand out as exceptionally good or exceptionally bad right like i don't want to be on anybody's lists for any reason i just want to be an anonymous part of this machine so that i am i am drawn to the attention of as few people as possible that sounds weird but again it's i think it's easy to conflate like what are your goals versus like what are the the goals of the institution in which you work and sometimes it's a little easy to think of co-workers as friends but if you're really trying to achieve this goal of, of independence you, like you can't necessarily treat co-workers as bosom buddies that you share everything with like it just these are these are mutually conflicting goals and it's like you have to you have to pick which set of trade-offs you are willing to willing to live with i have a couple of ask cortex questions and we can wrap it up today okay So this is a couple that I just wanted to pick out for today because I like them. Thank you to everybody who is sending them in. And I've seen a very uh, great adoption of the new hashtag. So everybody is doing exactly as told, Gray, which I'm sure will make you very happy. It does make me very happy. So please continue to send those in. Uh, I like to let them build up and we can knock out or maybe do another one of the Q&A types that it shows at some point in the future. But I like to add them in every now and then. Because one thing that they also do, uh, why I may not ask the questions explicitly, is they help inform future topics as well. So that's always very useful. But uh, Vera asked, have you tried any of the virtual keyboard replacements on the iPhone? Um, Vera likes SwiftKey. Have you, Mike? Yeah, I have, and there are a lot of good ones. The problem is Apple just doesn't care about it enough to make it a good experience in most instances where you end up having to switch between keyboards, which takes about a week, I think, to to press that button and wait for the new one to load up. Mm. Uh, And it just isn't as integrated as you would like, and you can't get rid of the standard keyboard. Um, the, the the whole system needs more work and in iOS 9 there doesn't really seem to have been much change because there's some that I like I like SwiftKey um, I like the text expanded keyboard I like uh, Emoji++ Plus mm-hmm. Plus. Um, I like uh, the there's a, a Canada app called Sunrise and they have a great keyboard called Meet which allows you to schedule meetings really easily from a keyboard which is really awesome that one seemed crazy to me I saw people talking about that when it first came out and I was like 
What do you mean your keyboard is your calendar? This doesn't make any sense. That was somebody thinking outside the box of what a keyboard is. And it's really interesting. It's a cool little uh, add-on. But the problem is it's just working with those on iOS is not a great experience in my opinion. But I know that you are a man who likes quirky keyboard uh, entry setups, Mr. Dvorak. (laughs) So have you tried anything? I mirror all your sentiments about the keyboards not working great on iOS. But I actually do largely use uh, an additional keyboard. And the one I use is called Flexi, which uh, I really quite like. And I use that exclusively on my iPhone. I don't use it on the iPads. And I use it largely because I hate on the iPhone when you turn it into landscape mode, Apple's dumb little in the center keyboard. Yeah, you should be able to split it. Yeah, you should be able to split it, or at the very least, they should put all those dumb buttons on the side that you hit by accident that you never mean to. Put those in the middle and put the keyboard on either side. But, you know, even if even if they don't want to do a split thing like they do on the iPad, just put the keys near your thumbs and put those extra buttons that you don't frequently use in the middle. Uh, so I, I cannot abide using the built-in one in Landscape. So I I do have Flexi installed on my iPhone, and I use it actually most of the time. Uh, they have a few updates that have helped with stability, but it is still Apple's fault for not making it super great. But I really do like using that one in landscape mode. So that's that's what I use. And the next one is, uh, I would be very interested to know, is that actually Eric asked, are you a fan of 10-hour versions of songs? So this is the thing that you see quite a lot on YouTube. Somebody loops a song for 10 hours. Oh, I didn't realize that's what they're asking about. I, I I don't know this then at all. Someone just loops a single song for 10 hours. Why don't you just put it on repeat one like I do all the time? I don't know. It's just a thing that's on YouTube. It's like, for example, uh, the Making Bacon Pancakes song from Adventure Time. There is a 10-hour version of it, and the song is about 15 seconds. <laughs> so it just carries on around and around and around, and you watch these things for 10 hours. This sounds like the song that never ends. Exactly. It just goes on and on, my friend. Right. Okay. I, I I am unfamiliar with someone just looping a song for 10 hours on YouTube. I, I put single songs on repeat sometimes for many, many hours in a row. That seems like it's functionally the same thing. I don't know why I would need to go to YouTube to listen to one that is simply 10 hours long. What I thought you were asking about is songs that have been stretched to be ridiculously long. Do you know what I'm talking about? You don't know what I'm talking about. I don't think so. Oh, Mike, you are just not the connoisseur of music that I am. When you say stretch, you just mean a song that is written to be very long or that something's happened to it. (sighs) Mike, 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 hold on. Or like when... (laughs) I've seen a thing before where people slow down music to make it very long. Here we go. This is the only example that I know of this, but it is someone who has taken a Justin Bieber song, and they've reduced it to make it 800% slower. And I actually think it is amazing, and I have listened to this several times. I I, I actually really like this as bizarre background music. It's it's very interesting to listen to. But yes, if you take a song and you super stretch it, I, I would really like to know technically how they did it. Because it doesn't sound like they... Like they just dropped the speed. I, I, I like they must have done some interpolation or something. But anyway, I uh, I do quite like this song that is slowed down eight hundred percent by Justin Bieber. So that's what I thought you meant by ten hour songs, but apparently apparently not. I don't have it, any idea. Because usually song. when you slow something down like this, it makes it sound like this, which right. this doesn't really have that. Yeah, it's like they've slowed they've slowed it down, but they've kept the pitch all right. It's it's very it's very strange. I I've. Uh, I remember trying to figure out what they did, and if you actually just make it go 800% faster, you can hear that it doesn't sound normal at that speed. So they've done some adjustments to it to make it sound okay. But uh, yeah, there's uh, my music recommendation for the week from my cultured selection of new music that I always like to listen to. Justin Bieber, 800% slower. Check it out, people. Heard it here first. CGB Grey is a fan of very slow Justin Bieber. Don't forget to buy t-shirts. Oh, all right, yeah, t-shirts. Teespring.com slash Cortex. Go and buy them, support the show, and wear a monkey on your chest, and we'll be very happy about it. 